Boom. Hello, everybody. We're on week three. Isn't that great? Very halfway there. It's awesome. How are you guys liking entrepreneurship so far? You got a thumbs up? Awesome. Yeah. It's great. Thanks so much, Chef. Ah, oh, so glad you guys think so too. All the rest of you that are coming in. <laughs> so this week, let me share my screen. We got we're talking about labor. Yay! But before we talk about labor, let's check out all the fun stuff we have going on. Because remember, week two assignment for late submission is due tonight. Right, Chef Jonathan? How are all the assignments looking for week two? Pretty good. I really enjoyed seeing the week two assignments. You guys pulled some really great information about, out about those different regulations for your areas. I did want to talk about just a couple of places. This being part of your business plan, if you're asked what a liquor license is, you want to be more specific about it's a liquor license or it's a license to sell alcohol. You want to dig in and figure out exactly which liquor license in your area you're going to need. Because, for instance, in my area, I there are like 30 different liquor licenses. And I only need one of those to sell wine, beer, and liquor. So I want to say exactly which liquor license I'm, I'm looking at. That'll help whoever you're presenting this material to understand exactly what it is you're talking about with this business and that you know exactly what you're doing. Um, I saw a ton of .gov websites, which I loved. But if you did have some .coms in there, that's generally okay as long as you go into whatever presentation you're going into with the answer to the question, why did you choose this source and what makes it reliable for this information? Why exactly can you believe these people about liquor licenses or labor laws, for instance? If you have the answer, you're usually pretty good. <laughs> the, what I noticed, Chef Jonathan, was that a lot of the dot coms that I was looking at would just reference those same .gov sites. So I was like, well, why don't I just go to the .gov site and get the actual information instead of, you know, kill, just kill the middleman. Exactly. Exactly. And it's more legit. If you're getting it from a government website, it's going to be more legit than that .com. Because I can make a .com right now. I can go to like GoDaddy and make one just for fun. <laughs> uh, another thing, I had a few people reach out to me that they actually contacted their local fire department or their local city hall or whomever else and were getting actual real numbers together um, and getting in touch with their local government bodies, which was so cool to hear. That is by far the quickest way to cut through if you have a hundred page document and that's all you can find, ask for help. There's always somebody who can be like, oh yeah, that's on page 37. <clears throat> so you should always try to reach out to somebody if you're getting a little caught up because usually they love when they get questions as long as they're legitimate questions, not like wasting their time questions. <laughs> but they love hearing I'm in school, I'm trying to figure this out in my experience. And I mean, it's about making the connections now, right? Because I dearly love JJ, the fire inspector, and Sean, the fire marshal, who are located in Fort Collins. And they would answer any question I had, which was great. I have like, you know, they would come and even look at if I put the, um, my fire extinguisher is in the right spot and they would just come in and be like, yeah, just move like this looks good, but just move it over here and then you'll be fine. And they were happy to do it. Um, they are also happy to get any type of pastries um, that you may make them and it sweetens the deal if, you know, 
the answer to the question because I would feed them all the time. I just give them cookies. We got to the point where if a um, if our fire alarm went off, different uh, um, different stations would start to battle who would come to see what it was so that they could get the cookies and the muffins because <laughs> majority like because if there was one it was usually a false call and then like you know and then I'd call them up let them know but they would still have to come out anyways so um but yeah so start the cookie bribery now <laughs> right <laughs> it's a great great way to get people to come check out your place am I right yeah yeah, and then we also have week three assignment. It's going to be a due on Tuesday. Everything's always due on Tuesday, am I right? Except for week six, right? Yeah, not week six, but week three, due on Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. And then once again, we will have our live session because they're just awesome. They're super duper fun. Right? So, uh, remember, when we talked about the different laws and regulations that we talked about last week. Remember all that fun stuff that we talked about? It's happening again. Now you're gonna look at all that fun information that you found out and you can use it going towards this week. Your labor, because it will help you understand how much staff you're gonna need. So you need to always do the research, right? Yay, research. I love this little dinosaur thing. I try to use it as much as I can because I absolutely love that thing. So, um, but you need to know the laws and regulations in your area because it's important to figure out how many hours people are allowed to work. What's the minimum wage looking like? Do you think you're going to, um, like, what are their overtime laws? Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Oh, I said that. You're saying something about minimum wage reminded me. Oh, yeah. To talk about. So you guys, a lot of you had 213 plus another number for your tipped employees. I don't know if you caught it or not, but that's the tip credit. So they can count their tips per hour to hit that minimum wage, that's the actual minimum wage. But if they don't make that much in tips, you, the employer, have to pay that out. I meant to say that, and that's my bad. No, that's good. But remember, um, remember that wonderful sheet that I gave you guys that had those whole list of questions that's on the main page? That's there, and it answers a lot of those questions that you need to know, like what is, are you allowed to pull tips? Uh, what is maternity? leave in your area what are you required to do if somebody is uh just had a baby and needs to you know pump those are kind of things that you need to be aware of how um what about salaried employees are you going to pay them overtime because remember in some states like mine colorado uh, if a salary employee makes less than 50, I want to say $53,000, uh, you have to pay them overtime. So if you were thinking for this delightful assignment, doing your weekly schedule and that you were going to have your, your staff who you're paying 45 or your chef who you're paying $45,000 for your, um, on salary that you're like, oh, he can work 70, 80, 60 hours, you have to pay them overtime. So you don't want them working 70, 60, 80 hours because that's going to add up. That's going to be a big labor cost that you guys have to consider. So you have to think about those things. Did you guys find out that information when you were looking? Yeah, I already started on this week's assignment. No, so I probably got about half of it done. And with me being in fast food for almost 25 years, almost 28 years, being in management now that, and training other stores, now that I knew half of that already. Now that so even when I was pulling in more hours than my ADA at Arby's, 
my checks are bigger than hers because I was getting paid was as the salaried and with the overtime. Yeah. And that's, you know, you don't want to do that for your business. For you working, that's like awesome. You know, you got extra income. It's all about it. But for your business, that's not really going to be what you want. Um, so you need to make certain that when you're looking at stuff, you're going to be proactive. You want to be proactive because a lot of times many managers and business owners, they react to labor. They didn't think ahead. They didn't think, oh, it's Mother's Day. Maybe we should have extra people on uh, to help with the lunch rush or, oh, um, they didn't look at what the festivals were going on in their town and didn't realize that half of the, t like the people, the staff took off, asked for that time off to go to that festival. Um, those are things because in Port Collins, there's like a billion festivals, like, especially in the summertime. There's, there's a plethora. I actually stay away from the whole town during summertime just because there is so much, you know, there's so much going on. So I don't want to even, I don't even want to go down there. Right. But then people like, you have to think about those type of things. What's the seasonality uh, looking like? Are you in a mountain ski town where it's not, it's going to be super, super busy during the winter time versus the summertime. So you need to start hiring early to get the help for the winter time. And what if you live by the beach and then you need all those people working during the summertime and not as many people during the winter time when it's the off season. Those are things that you need to be proactive about so that you can be prepared. Uh, I even had a friend who uh, he was a chef and he would cook in the Cape during the summertime. And then in the wintertime, he'd go up to Vermont to ski. Um, so he just go, you know, back and forth, back and forth. Um, so for those who ever thought about doing something like that, he loved it. So yeah, beach in the summertime, ski during the wintertime. He loved it. So when you're thinking about all the different your different staff, you have to think about back of the house versus front of the house, right? And you guys remember this delightful back of the house brigade system? Who made this wonderful brigade system? Wasn't it Chef Escoffier? Yes. Yeah, Augustine. Yeah, I was trying to think the last name. <laughs> Give you a hint right here. Yeah, Augustine Escoffier. <laughs> yes, he created the classic brigade system that is seen today. So, and I love it. I mean, would you rather be, uh, which one is the, let me pull it back up. The patissia for pastry. I love that. I, this one's my favorite. The fritz, the frittier the frittiere, instead of just saying fry cook, you can say, I was a frittiere at an establishment instead of just saying I was a fry cook. So <laughs> it sounds better, right? It's all about marketing. So you have all of these great things. Garmerge, I oh, love Garmerge. How many people have taken Garmerge? Have you guys taken that class yet? Do they have that class yet? No? Oh, but you guys talk, you have a Garmage section, right? Yeah, okay, right. It's my favorite. Garmage, that's what I, I always like to say that that would teach you how to survive in a zombie apocalypse because you're learning how to can, you're learning about your sauces, how to make mayonnaise, how to do, you know, like your ketchup, your mustards how to um, make your pâtés and your aspects to make your food last longer. It's all about pre like preserving your food and, you know, making your own beef jerky. You're going to survive the zombie apocalypse. Other people will not, but you will because you have the skills to use all parts of the animal and all different parts of the uh, 
of your, yeah, your garden. Yeah. Everything that you made in that garden, you can throw that in your garden rajah. You're going to make it, pre preserve it, turn it into a jelly, turn it into a jam, turn it into a chutney. People go crazy for chutneys. I don't know what it is. Every time I see that on a menu, people like are always like, oh my God, oh, it's a chutney. And I'm like, huh, yeah, it's just a chutney. But yeah, people go crazy for it. And then you have your front of the house, right? Your typical positions. If you have your sommelier, they're going to, what do you guys think the sommelier is? Anybody? Front of the house manager. Or a lead lead uh, lead waiter. Like that. As, I went all over the board on that doing it. I know. <laughs> as Jeff Jonathan is trying to point out, there the, they do the wine. Am <laughs> I right, right, Jeff? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I was like, oh, oh. you need a wine glass. You took a wine glass for that. <laughs> and then you have your, like, your dining room manager, all that stuff. But if you guys are like, wow, I've never heard of this before. What is all of this? You have the more basic style of job titles that you may see today, not the classical ones. Because uh, it really depends on your the place that you're going to work, right? And we have everything from baker to banquet manager to expediter, all of these fun things. And why I gave you this list also is because it gives you little definitions for every single one. So if you guys had questions, you can look it up on this list. Isn't that fun? Yes, Chef, it's so great. Oh, God, I'm so glad that you guys think so. Ah, oh, yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, Aaron, what did you try? It just says, I tried. What did you try? I think I you to BS my way through that answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> think of it as an artistic interpretation upon the question that was asked. That's what I do when my recipes don't turn out. I say, I'm going to take an artistic interpretation upon this recipe. Like my mom, my poor mother, who, bless her heart, um, is English and nobody taught her how to cook. Um, so I, now I tell her, I'm like, it's not burnt, it's blackened. You can just call it blackened cauliflower and blackened, you know, broccoli. It's just putting a little twist on it. You can get better. So when now, when you think about your staff, are you going to do a sous chef? Are you going to have wait staff? Are you going to have a bartender? All those fun little things. There's some things you have to think about when you're looking at how much staff do you need, right? So how big is your establishment going to be? Are you going to be serving 200 people or are you going to be doing 50 people? That's going to make a difference on how much staff you're going to do. Uh, what's your concept? How, what is everybody's concept thus far been? What do you guys want to, what are you going to do? Mine's a French country bistro. French country bistro. Ooh. Sounds very posh. Sounds very, uh, are you doing high end? Mediocre. Mediocre. Mediocre French country bistro. Okay, what about everybody yeah. else? Well, it's me. I'm doing a, like a home style American diner. Now that that's also kid oriented, so they have a place where they can be creative and have fun. Now that like an alcove where they can read in, create what they want comes to mind. Oh, nice, nice. Now, what about uh, what about everybody else? What are you guys gonna do? A jazz supper club. Jazz supper club. Oh yeah, Tiffany. That's right. <gasps> yeah. Did you ever check out those websites that I gave you for that? Yes, I did. 
Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. That was pretty awesome. I was so excited about that. <laughs> it was like I could just see Fred Astaire right now. Ginger Rogers, Fred Astaire. I could see it. All right. So when you're thinking about this, you got to think about, oh, Jennifer, what are you, if you're talking, you're muted. I can't see. Oh, okay. Um, you know, you have to think about how big the establishment is, right? How much staff do you need? How much wait staff do you need? Are you doing it where it's, you know, counter service where you're not really going to need a wait staff. You're just going to need like a cashier or are you doing a uh, full sit down, like Russian style service where you think of Downton Abbey for anybody who's watched Downton Abbey, you know, the servers came around with the, you know, or Bob's burgers bridge was a bridge Thor manor when, you know, they had to serve the food and all that good stuff. No way. Nobody. No. Aww. But, so, or think about pretty woman. You guys remember pretty woman? You guys seen that one? Yep. Yeah. Do you remember when she went to the super duper fancy place and they had like, they had everybody, they had people in the white gloves, popping the champagne, making all sure everything was good. There was a 50 billion things of utensils for absolutely every possible thing. It's that ultra high, ultra five star high dining experience. You know, you're going to need a lot of wait staff for that. So you have to take those things into consideration. You also have to take into consideration the size of your kitchen because the size of your kitchen will determine how many cooks you can actually have in there at one time. Because some people will be like, oh yeah, I'm going to have like, you know, 10 cooks. It's going to be great. But then you walk in and only two people can fit. Then you're only, you're only going to schedule two people, you know, people that can fit. Am I right, chef? Yeah, and so this is a great time to think back to 155, where you guys actually built your own kitchens for your concept. You guys know about how big your your kitchen's going to be from that class. This week, you get to kind of think about how many stations that was, and you get to actually put people in place and think about when your rushes are and when your slow times are, and it's a fun assignment. I love this one. <laughs> And then you also have to think about with your concepts, are you making everything in-house versus pre-made? Because if you're making everything in in-house, that's going to be a lot more labor. That also means that you can't just have, if the doors open at 10 a.m., you can't have all your staff showing up at 10 a.m. You need to think about what time they need to come in to prep front of the house and back of the house because your front of the house needs to prep just as much as your back of the house does. They need to get the salt and pepper shakers ready and the ketchup bottles and doing all the, the twirling of the utensils around the napkins. Am I right, Chef? Yeah, that, um, what did we call it? Back work, side work as a yes, server? Yes, thank you. Eat up some time. Um, so, Chef, I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. You have a good generalized rule for family style dining about how many tables per server. Oh, how many tables per server? Oh, I remember this. It was like a, there was a calculation you could do. And I'm trying to remember what it, like the calculation was for that one. Wasn't it like, uh, I want to say it was like, yeah, I'd have to rem I'm going to have to look. I'm not remembering. I wanted to say it was like five. Five to one, I believe, yeah. because that's what I've learned in talking to other restaurants now that when I go in there. So the way that I've always approached it is 20 seats. So it, that might be five, four tops, or it might be a 12 top and maybe one other table. It depends on what section that server has, but if you think about it in terms of seats, then you're really thinking about how many people that server has to pay attention to. That's not a hard and fast industry standard by any means, but that's how I found 
works for me. Yeah. And there is a whole thing too, that I, I'm going to find it and I'm going to put it in the link tonight too, because there is a whole little thing that is bl- boggling my mind at this point, but it ha- it shows like square footage, how many tables, and then gives you the whole, like how many, um, you know, how many each wait staff can have. Cause then you can also run into the issues if you're a mom and pop place where you're like, Oh, the kids will do the tables and you're like yeah that's great the like your two children are now wait staff for your entire restaurant like that's going to be a lot you know so you have to think about those type of things when you're looking at um how much staff you need and sure. yes um i just want to just chime in real quick i've um waited tables and also bartend for a very long time and i found that most places you get four tables on standard on a busy night, Friday, Saturday, you get four tables per server. But in the finer dining um, establishments, you might only get three because you have to pay more detailed oriented. Um, you give them more detail oriented service, which quote unquote, I mean, you're supposed to give detail oriented service to everyone, but I'm just saying. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just, and I mean, I've worked in Philadelphia, Atlanta, and also okay. out here in Northern Virginia. So that's just what I've noticed. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And another thing you have to think of too is your hours of operation. Like, are you going to be a 24 hour diner, Patricia, or are you going to be a starts at 6 a.m. goes until like 10 p.m. kind of place? Yeah. I was thinking from 6 a.m. to midnight. Yeah. Because then you're going to want to make certain that you have people covering that entire time frame. So those are right. things you need to think about too. Right. And then of course, what's your budget? How much can you really afford of your wait staff, you know? Right. Can you afford, you know, to be able to pay for everybody or do you need to re-examine your numbers to make certain that you actually have the correct uh percentages and costs and stuff to cover right. everybody? Those are great things to look at. And then some things to consider when you're coming up with your schedule because you guys are going to write a schedule, right? Obviously, you have to for this assignment. You're going to have to do it all the time. Uh, What are some things? If I quickly go down, what do you guys think you have to think about for when you're looking at your schedule? Well, when the next person will be coming in, if your first shift is you're opening at 6 a.m., that you want someone there at least by 4, 4.30 until 10, 10, 30 or a little bit later and have them come an hour or a half hour early so there's coverage. Yeah, because you want to make sure you have overlap, right? That uh-huh. way, anything happens. If the region is broken, if your stove is not working, that person that just finished that shift can tell the new person, hey, by the way, these are the issues we ran into. This is what we saw. Um, yes, George, having the staggering shifts. Mm -hmm. So that you can actually make sure that your staff is talking to each other. You have that communication. Like you guys can have a pre-staff meeting, go over all the different stuff. Now, how many people worked at a place where it was that high dining, um, like fine dining, high end, they only opened during the evening time and everybody got a pre-shift meal? You guys know that? Chef Jonathan, how was your experience with that? I loved it. I liked it a lot better than when they said everybody's going to have a big family meal at the end of the shift. That. Oh, they did it at the end? Uh, <gasps> I've seen it both ways. Yeah. So, um, one restaurant I worked in, we had our busiest night ever in the history of this restaurant. They got a James Beard Award that week. It was the night before Mother's Day. 
on a Saturday night. We were totally booked with reservations and they were still letting walk-ins come in. It was a crazy, crazy night and they didn't have anybody eat until the doors were closed and the last guest left. So that made for a bit of unhappy staff. But before the shift starts, it's really nice. However, it totally stops production. So it it's does. great for morale. But you want to balance that with how much efficiency do you really need to be going on at that time? Because some reasons why people do the pre-shift is because everybody gets together, they can sample, maybe it's like a special that they're sampling, and then everybody can talk about the menu and be like, hey, this is the new wine that you can say, like, especially for the wait staff, they can be, try the food and be like, this is the wine that you should pair with it. So if people order this, you can tell them about this wine. Like, it's a great way to get people to you know, collaborate, work together. The wait staff can ask questions about the meals right then and there. So they know like, hey, what is in this thing? Is there any like peanuts? Is there gluten? Is there dairy? Any of that type of stuff. Um, so they can really help with the upsell of stuff. But like Chef Jonathan said, that does eat into your production. So that's just one of those things that as a business owner, you have to think about and take into consideration. They're both good and bad parts to everything. So it's just a matter of figuring out what's going to outweigh each other, you know, so you get to decide. But that pr after shift, oh, I've not worked at a place like that. That is rough. Like, Please don't do that to your staff. That was rough. <laughs> man. That is bad. So what else do you guys have to think about when you, things to take into consideration when you're looking at your schedule? You want to have extra people for if someone calls off for sick or something. Yeah, because stuff happens all the time, right? So you yes. want to make sure that you have extra staff available. That has happened to me where my staff, one girl was on vacation and, um, Another girl called in sick. There is only two of us left. I was making pancakes for myself, flipped the pancake, and pancake batter went straight into my eye. And it was like, yeah, <laughs> it was like, um, and this was before glasses because yeah, it was before glasses. So straight into my eye. Thank God my mom's an eye nurse and gave me 50 billion like eye drops already. So there was no damage from that. My son did the damage, which is why I have these delightful glasses. But um, but that was that moment where I'm like, I don't have any staff. No one can like come in. Everybody else is sick. I have to do this catering with one good eye right now. So don't make my mistake <laughs> and make sure you have extra people so that you will be okay. Yeah, George, making sure a manager is on duty at all times. Yes, that is so, so important, especially at the end of the night. Why is it so important at the end of the night, Chef Jonathan? <laughs> Especially if you have a bar. That's what I was going to say. Um, in my wonderful experience, when the managers go away, the employees raid the bar for everything it's worth. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Even employees, if they're not given the clear direction, this person's in charge. If nobody knows they're in charge, nobody's going to listen to them you want to make sure you have a manager who everybody knows is a manager on duty. Because I can easily say, yeah, I'm just going to have my one glass of wine, which I've allowed, but my one glass of wine is going to be on this mother of a water glass. And I'm going to fill that wine all the way up here. And that's going to be my one glass of wine. Like I've seen that before people come in with like a big gulp, you know, the big, big gulps, and then just load that with alcohol. You don't want that to happen to you. That is a cost. It is a pricey, pricey cost. 
because that is one less drop going into your customers who will pay the upcharge for it. What else? <laughs> Remember, Ed, Jeff? You are. I to mention what happens if somebody gets hurt while they're under the influence while drinking on the job. Yes, exactly. Thank Aaron. you. That's exactly what I was going to say, Erin. Thank you. Yes. Um, so what else do you think about for scheduling? Miners. Yes, George. You have to think about those delightful miners because each state has different roles. How long uh, are miners allowed to work for? You guys know? On a school night. That was one of the questions on that delightful paper I gave you guys too. Yeah, miners are allowed to work between a combination of school hours and work hours, a total of 48 in a week. Yeah, but how long? Because if it's on a school night, say in Colorado, they are not allowed to work past, uh, what is it, 7 p.m. on a seven. school night. Yeah. I think it's 7 p.m., either 7 p.m. or 9 p.m. Now I'm getting, I'm going to look that up and um, 9 p.m., 9 p.m., yeah, it could be 9 p.m. But those are things you need to make certain that you know, because if you have a 15 year old bus boy and you're like yeah just work another half hour you'll be fine and it's 9 30 it's not gonna be fine you'll get in trouble so when you're looking at your schedules you got to think about that type of stuff too uh what else do you guys think about making sure things that need to be done are getting done what do you mean jennifer Uh, cleaning and things like you said about having someone there to specifically tell everyone what needs to be done a manager or a supervisor or something to make sure that everything gets followed yeah you also want to make certain that you know you are able to prep accordingly right that you have and remember the best way to look at it as I like to say is catering catering you have to prep you have to drive there you have to unload set everything up then have the service actually happen then tear everything down then you gotta load it all back up in the van then you gotta drive it back down and then you have to take it out of the van and you have to clean it all and put it away so a lot of people, when they're like, oh, yeah, no, it's just a catering. It's only going to be like, a, like it's only a three-hour event. I can totally be able to do it. But it's the three hours just for that event. You got to think about, you know, all that time that you spent driving, yeah. all that time for cleaning, putting gas, now that going to and from, how far, the distance, mileage, everything. Now, yeah. And oh, yeah. Time for getting loading the truck and when you get back and unloading and putting everything away. Yeah. Uh, it's really adding another three to four hours onto that three hour event. Right. Exactly. And then, so what else do you guys think we have to worry about for the schedule? Breaks. Breaks. Lunches. Lunches. What else? What about opening and closing? Opening and closing, yep. Exactly. Because you cannot have somebody work from 6 a.m. until like 10 p.m. That's not nice. And then expect I've them to open I've up done. again at 6 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> like, I've done it. Yeah, I've done it too. And it's not, it's not nice. <laughs> but, no, it's not. You've got to earn that $25,000 with no overtime. Yeah. So, and then you also have to think about being nice. Like, are you going to give your staff two days off in a row? Are you going to be able to do that? Are you going to, what about if somebody wants to go on vacation? Alternating, if, alternating their days. What if somebody, yeah, like, and what if somebody wants to, like, you know, calls in sick, like we talked about, goes on vacation, wants the day off, like, how... 
nice are you going to be? While you want to be as accommodating as you can, you also have to remember that you are running a business. So while you're trying to be nice, you still need to make certain that you're covering all of the hours that you need to cover for your business to stay open. Because you don't want to, and I'm going to use Bob's Burgers again, another issue like Linda who gave everybody the day off when she decided to be a manager for a grocery store and she was the only one working on at the grocery store everybody else left you don't want that to happen to you so that is why it is so important to make certain that while you are being as flexible as you can be you have to at the end of the day you got to run your business And this is not just for entrepreneurs. This is for managers, for everybody. Well, wouldn't part of that be set up in your uh, policies? I mean, if you're going to run a business, you got to have some kind of policies in place for employees. So if you want a vacation, I need a couple of weeks in advance notice. Exactly. For that. So you're able to prepare for it, you know, and, and shift schedules around as needed. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. And you want to have those policies and procedures in place so that people know what to expect. Because if you don't, then, you know, anybody can just be like, well, I'm going to take tomorrow off. Like, cool. See ya. And just leave you hanging. If you don't have the policies and procedures in place that say like, well, you, if you're going to request time off, you need to request it a month in advance or however much time you want to give them then you need to make certain that you actually, you know, um, you actually have it covered. And yes, George, an SOP is phenomenal. I'm so glad you said SOP, standard operating procedure. It is so important to have because then it can tell people what their expectations are. And then you can also use great software to be able to, do the scheduling for you that'll help you out for your business. So like shift sevens, I wanted to point this out. So if you get to that point, Excel works just as well, but there are some ones like this that will actually help create the schedule and it's automatic scheduling for you. And they will actually link it to your POS system. So you can track all of this great information but um so there are these systems out here that can do it for you but we got a good old excel sheet that you can work on and practice because it's always important to practice with excel am i right like you got to know the basics which you guys know and then you just realize that oh yeah there is a like software out there that will do it for me but if you know but now you know you could do it on your own am i right chef jonathan all right and speaking of that handy excel sheet yeah am i good yeah that's, you're good your assignment? all I right did really well of like yeah, that was moving great. it into like <laughs> you that. Doing the assignment. <laughs> all right guys so this week's assignment as you may have figured out if you didn't already know coming in is building your own schedule So if you go to the week three class page, you're just going to come down to the usual place for your assignment. Click on that link right there. And then this is really important. Click this week three labor schedule link. That will bring it, excuse me, that will make you make a copy of this schedule. This schedule is enormous. You do not have to fill out the whole thing. You only have to fill out the pieces that are relevant for your business. So the first thing, what needs to be on this sheet? You guys have heard it from me at least eight weeks. No, I know. Your concept. concept. Yes. Yes. Concept summary right here at the top. You can just type it in right here. Poor Jones. Just a heads up. I tried. It, It won't let you. Oh, really? Oh, right. Thank you for that. So it's going to give you this error message, which yes. I need to fix. But until I do fix that, just press, don't show this again, and hit OK. And it'll let you type in there. Um, just so you know, that is my bad, not yours. 
Uh, your next step is to go down here to this position. And what do you think I'm going to put in this white box here? The I'm manager, manager schedule, uh, yes. the crew schedule. So guys, the first person I want you to schedule is yourself. And there is a really big reason for that. You are performing vital tasks to your business and those need to be accounted for and you need to get paid. You need to include your own pay in your labor budget. So make sure the first person you schedule here is yourself. So you're gonna say owner. And if you're gonna be the executive chef here, say owner chef, owner front of house manager, owner GM, whatever your role is that you're actually performing while you're on the clock, that's what you're putting here. Um, these little boxes, as you can see, this top row, for each employee is going to be when they start their shift. And it's a nice little drop down box. So you're going to say, okay, I'm going to get in at 6 a.m. every single day. The second box is when you're going to leave every day. So if you're going to work 6 a.m. to 4 p.m., that's all you got to do. Um, you select your in time, your out time. If you want to have a consistent schedule every single day, you can highlight these, press control C and press control V or copy and paste it anywhere you want. And it'll bring those numbers across. So you don't necessarily have to click every single drop down box. Um, I have a question. Yes. Now, with being the owner, wouldn't you have more hours uh, for yourself? Because isn't. Um, Limit of 15 or 20 hours. 15 or 20 hours? Uh, no, I guess I, I'm not... no, that for, of being the owner. I know you can work more than what's expected of you. Now that... If you're on salary, remember, you have to pay yourself overtime. Right. That's why I'm asking the question. And yeah. Right. So, yes, you're probably going to end up working more hours than are on that schedule. Which right. brings, which I'm so glad you brought up. I don't want to see any salaried managers over 60 hours a week because you're going to work more hours than you're scheduled for. It's kind of a fact of life in our industry. And any, if you're scheduled for 60 hours and you're working 70, 80 hours a week, that is pushing a burnout schedule. And you do not want to burn yourself out and you do not want to burn your staff out. Does that make sense, Patricia? Yeah, that's why I was asking because I know at some of the places that I was at, they gave you like a 10 to 15 hour leverage now that was the most hours that you could put in for the week itself other than your hours that you're scheduled. And remember, you need a day off too. Right. You can't just be like, I'm just going to work every single day. Like you'll, you'll burn out, burn out fast. So you need to give your time, self time and to refresh and recharge. Right. If I see somebody schedule themselves like this, what I have shown here, I will dock you points because you have no time off and your weekly total hours is over 60 hours. That's a problem from a staffing perspective and from an owner perspective. So just be aware of that. This box here, this is gonna be your total weekly hours. So every time you add in a shift, that number is gonna go up for that employee. So you're gonna fill out your whole weekly shift and if I can get out of that, and then you're gonna have to pay your employees, right? So you either pay them an hourly rate, which you just looked up the minimum wages for your area. I'm going to tell you right now, you want to pay your people more than minimum wage. Just that's the best way to keep them. And it's the best way to attract good talent. But you're either going to pay an hourly rate or a weekly salary rate. Let's say I want to work. I want to pay myself $52,000 a year. Well, this box tells you how to change that annual salary 
into a weekly salary, you just take 52,000, divide it by the number of weeks, 52, that gives you your weekly salary. Easy peasy, right, Patricia? I think so, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, a couple other things. Uh, management. Please do not have 10 people all on salary. That's not how our industry works. And it mm, is a lot of times not legal for your area. In general, a uh, manager has to have at least two people that they are supervising. And at mm -hmm. least 50% of their time has to be spent in a supervisory role. So what does that actually mean when I say that? Right. I also so, dropped it in the chat just in case you guys are wondering. Mm -hmm. Right. So, because normally with where I work at, it's your store manager salary, your general manager, your assistant is normally salary, then it's your shift. Now that and those are hourly. Mm -hmm. Right. So, let's say I have a food truck. It's going to be me. I can't run that food truck alone because I can't both cook and touch money. So, I'm going to yep. need at least a cashier. Chances are, if I'm really busy, I'm probably going to need another person. And with a food truck, remember, it's going to take you more time in the morning to get prepped and to get all that food from your commissary kitchen onto your truck. And at the end of the shift, it's going to take you more time because you got to take all that food off the truck, clean the truck, clean your commissary kitchen, store all your food appropriately before you can go home. Plus, you got to drive in between. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you are a personal chef, I want you to approach this like it's the biggest week of the year and your client has asked you to cater an event for a hundred people. So you need to staff up and you need to start staffing up earlier in the week because you're going to need help getting things prepped, getting things ordered and inventoried and where they need to be in storage. You're going to need help with serving the food. You're going to need help with cleaning up after the event, a dishwasher. You're probably going to be hiring temp workers, calling your friends who you know and know how to do these things. You're going to be hiring people and paying them to help you out with that kind of an event. So I do want to see other staff, even if the only person you expect to be on your payroll in an average week is yourself, I want you to approach it from that angle. What am I missing here, Chef? Catering company, same thing. Oh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. What were you gonna say? <clears throat> Catering company is the other fairly common concept summary that I've seen. Same thing, I want you to assume you're gonna be pretty busy if you are planning on only having weekend events. While you're still prepping up during the week, you're still talking to potential clients during the week, you're still doing all sorts of things during the week and other people are too. So. If I see a schedule that just has one person on it, I can't give you full credit and I really want to. <laughs> and then could you actually pull up the Excel sheet one more time? Absolutely. Because I wanted to make certain that everybody saw. You saw how Chef Jonathan did a fabulous job. Can you click on that daily hours? Like for Sunday, Monday? Ah, uh, yes. Right yeah, here? Yeah, click on that. Yeah, you see how long that code is? That wonderful, wonderful code to just make it so that that person's like lunch break is accounted for and stuff like that. You can, you should all give props to Chef Jonathan for doing that for you guys because he did that mamma jamma just for you guys. That whole long, long number of code so that it would instantaneously do it for you so you didn't have to worry about doing it so i would just say give a good shout out for jeff jonathan for mastering that bad boy for you <laughs> because that is it a mother awful i <laughs> took it and the formulas are horrid so, i hated putting formulas uh they definitely take some getting used to for, for sure yeah, but yeah, Chef Jonathan went through a lot of work for you just to make that wonderfully easy <laughs> yeah. for you guys. Uh, so on that note, 
when you have your schedule put together. This has a daily total already for you. Please don't delete that, guys. That helps you. It does, it's not really there for me, it's to help you. I'm still gonna be able to tell if you're in overtime if you change that number, because I do look at that. So if you accidentally change that number, just hit Control Z, it'll undo it if you accidentally type in that, in that pink box. Your completed assignment is gonna look something like this. My concept summary tells, tells you what style of food, what style of concept it is. It's a restaurant serving American food. Uh, I've got 200 seats. I have my hours of operation. They're very simple. Yours may not be this simple. Um, I have both back of house and I have front of house staff. I have bartenders, I have servers, I have all sorts of wonderful people working for me on this schedule. Everyone's getting paid. Um, and that's it. Everybody's under overtime. Everybody's less than 40 hours a week. If any of these numbers go over 40 hours and they're not salaried, you gotta look at that schedule and try and figure out what went wrong for you. I got sure. a question for you, Chef Jonathan. Are yes. you limiting us on hours that we can use or are we adjusting that ourselves? There our is a little box for every half hour from midnight all the way to midnight. So you can put in any hours you want. However, please do not schedule people for more than 12 hours in a day. And if your area says that you have to pay overtime after eight hours in a day, don't schedule people for more than eight hours in a day. That's all. That's what I ask. Okay, and, because I've done the scheduling before. Now that when I was in fast food and everything, so I'm. It's been a while, but I've done it. But so, um, half the time they would give us a limited amount of hours for doing that for everyone. So, let me show you something cool about this. This is gonna give you an idea of what your labor cost is. Every time you add an hour, once you have your money in here, your hourly rates or your salary rates, it's gonna increase this annual payroll. So you can play with the hours as much or as little as you want, but if this is over a million dollars and you have a 50 seat restaurant, you're probably gonna to wanna to re-examine what you're doing. Yeah, then there's something wrong, definitely. Um, and I'll probably say something about that too, is, um, <laughs> is this might not be a realistic goal. Um, but and that is a consideration about, there. Yeah. Don't forget about like part-timers too. Mm -hmm. A lot of people tend to do like full-time, you know, and then forget about like, well, how am I supposed to cover the shift? And it's like, well, where's your part-timer? Like, where is that per like that part-time wait staff college student who's doing this on the side while they're going through culinary school, right? Yeah. Right, because normally your full-time is only your management. Everyone else is normally the part-timers. Well, it kind of depends on your and the, the business and that, but yeah. Yeah. Because that'll depend on your establishment. Because you can still have right. hourly employees that are full time, yes. have benefits, that kind of thing. Right. But that's um, also knowing your laws and regulations so that you know how much full time, how many hours somebody has to work full time consistently for the amount of months to determine if they get the benefits. All right, Jonathan, because I feel like you're just about to say that, Chef, and you. <laughs> like... I was totally going to say that. I was also going to add on to it a little bit. Yeah. Sometimes you're going to have part time chefs doing your prep work because prep work doesn't always need to be as detail oriented. But your saute cook at dinner, that's a pretty high skill level in, a, in most restaurants. You want that person to be pretty well committed to your restaurant and to know your menu through and through. The best way to do that is to have them on full time. All right. If you have them full time, then they're not looking elsewhere for employment the other nights and getting dishes confused and whatever else nonsense goes on with part timers sometimes. All right. Okay. So the more skill level with the position, I prefer to give those people more hours, the more skill I'm requiring out of them. All right. Okay. 
All right, guys. How are you guys feeling? Feeling good? Yeah. Feeling ready? So remember, the late submission for week two, you still have a shot. It's 11.59 p.m. tonight. So get her done. Right? And then when's the assignment due? Tuesday by 11.59 yeah, Tuesday by 11.59 p.m. Central Standard what? Time. Nobody's actually going to wait till Tuesday, are they? Yeah, yeah, no. God, no. Start now. Yeah. Start now. Well, it's still fresh. I, Go run I will now. say, guys, give yourselves a lot of time for this one. It is more complicated than it might seem. And you're going to hit bumps and obstacles going through this assignment and trying to get everything to work out right. It just takes time, so give yourselves a lot of time. Set some time aside for this assignment. Yes, please. All right, guys. Well, I hope everybody has a fabulous, fabulous rest of your week three. Looking forward to seeing all those early submits. Am I right? Yes. Going to try to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, guys. Well, yeah. I hope you have a great rest of your night and looking forward to seeing how everybody does for their assignment. And I'll see, we will see everybody next Thursday. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.